In the name of the living and loving God, who is creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as I said last Sunday, that Sunday and this Sunday are connected scripturally, both Ephesians and John, thematically, transformation. Um, and, and really the point of these, this series of these two sermons. So let me, let me, let me, let me get us all on board here. Um, Last Sunday, I started out with a list of threatening crises that we humans face, and I want to name them again. Pandemic running wild, climate change and environmental catastrophes, racism, both active and passive, terrorism, both domestic and global, democracy threatened by toxic partisanship, economy inequity, and widespread poverty immigrant challenges. And as I've said, God calls us to do something for the common good, for humanity, for the planet, for all of God's creation. So again, so again, I invite you to join me as we consider how to respond to God's call to action in these times of crises. As I said, I, I think a framework for this discussion, a framework for this message is this, community, spirituality, and transformation. And Ephesians picks right up where they, last, where they, where they ended last week with this message. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. I mean, use your brains making the most of the time because the days are evil, I would add, and dangerous. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Listen to God. Do not get drunk with wine. I would add to that for our culture. Do not be intoxic intoxicated by power, prestige, wealth, and control, but be filled with the Spirit of God, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Community, community. And in John, this beginning sentence is actually the ending sentence from last Sunday. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Spirituality. Of course, the, the passage goes on to talk more about that. Some of which cannot be accepted rationally, but certainly can be spiritually and that John is encouraging us and making the message that we will find a fruitful and faithful life if we accept the fullness of the life of Jesus, crucified and risen, which we celebrate in this Eucharist. Community, spirituality, and transformation which leads us to that lifelong practice of moving deeper into the identity with Jesus Christ so that we may truly discover and do God's will. That's what we're talking about today. And it always involves movement, usually from pain and suffering to hope and joy. Something new for this Sunday is I, I've got to make reference to the Great Commandment because Basically, we're looking for items, for messages about how do we make this decision to do what God wants us to do, this discernment. I'm saying community, spirituality, and transformation, but the great commandment is hard to beat. 
when that lawyer, the Pharisees, were cha challenging Jesus, and the lawyer said, Teacher, which commandment is the law in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Heart, soul, mind. Feelings, faith, thoughts. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Well, that's a good, that's a good basic statement. And some people, especially the Jesuits, which were founded by Ignatius of Loyola, even, even make it shorter. Love and serve God. Love and serve others. And of course, loving and serving God and loving and serving others comes most, most um, fully when we, in fact, love, it, love ourselves. And when we love and serve God and love and serve others, we can love us. You know, it's all interconnected and interwoven. But there's a problem. There's a problem in this lifelong journey that's called transformation or movement or whatever. The problem is that stumbling blocks pop up and we get bumped off of that transformation path. We have second thoughts and doubts we feel uncomfortable and fearful and confused. We are overwhelmed with so many issues that we just don't have enough energy to take on yet another complicated and emotionally fragile topic. So we back off and go silent. In some cases, silence is evil. Later on in this liturgy, we will ask God to deliver us from evil. Almost every day I experience in some challenge, I experience some challenge by the dark spirits in my soul to question God's call to action. I go a little silent. So let me give you an example from that listening, threatening list of crises we humans face um, to talk about. And that is passive racism. I think we're pretty clear about how we want it, what racism is, and I'm not going to talk about that. But passive racism means that we're not doing things, we're not participating in bad behavior, but we're not stepping up to the plate and naming what is wrong. So, so let me give you a specific example. It's a story about my mother, Harriet Breeden Charles. She was born in 1910 in Bennisville, South Carolina, a small rural town. And she was, she died in 2011. She lived to be 101 years old. Um, she was compassionate, she was polite, she was gracious and creative. She was religious, respected, hospitable, loving, artistic. She was a wonderful woman and a wonderful mother. And the first half of her life, from 1910 until 1960, she participated in passive racism. The first half of her life, she was silent. Good people didn't talk about it. 
They may be, we maybe didn't participate in it outwardly, but we didn't talk about the problems of it either until roughly the 60s. Not only did my mother have those wonderful characteristics which I just listed, but she also had a strong sense of what was right and what was wrong, um, morally, ethically, but also based on a, a deep faith in Jesus Christ. So let me tell you a little story about that. The summer of 2010, our family again gathered at a, a beach house in Pauley's Island, South Carolina for a week at the beach and a special time together. My mother um, suffered from, from serious dementia. It wasn't Alzheimer's, but it was serious dementia. Um, she still enjoyed being with people and liked laughing with people. Um, but one night, one night during that week, um, I was getting ready to put her to bed. I was standing at the door to her room. Joanne and I were there. And I kissed Joanne. And then Joanne left, and I turned and went to be with my mother. And she looked at, her, looked at me and had fire in her eyes, which took me aback. And she said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> well, at that moment, I felt like a six-year-old little boy, and I did feel ashamed of myself. I said, Mother, what are you talking about? She said, I saw you kissing that hussy. <laughs> I never heard her use that word in my life. <laughs> I said, Mother, that was my wife, Joanne. You know her. She said, oh, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. Of course it is. Please forgive me. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> but even with dementia, she was going to stand up for what was right and what was wrong. But she couldn't do that around the issue of racism because it wasn't done. She didn't have the skills or the energy or the inspiration to do it. The times have changed. The times have changed. Marion Wright Edelman. Do any of you all know who Marion Wright Edelman is? Marion Wright Edelman was born in Bennisville, South Carolina in 1939. Her mother was, was a um, pastor of a black Baptist church, with, which was vibrant. It had a great ministry with the, with the poor and the homeless, especially African Americans. And um, I would drive back when I got my driver's license, drive past that church every school day going to, going to school. Um, it was right there in the, on the edge of town. Um, in 1960, Marion Wright Edelman graduated as valedictorian from Spelman College in Atlanta. In 1963, she re received a law degree from Yale Law School. In 1968, um, she went to Washington, D.C. and worked with Martin Luther King Jr. on the Poor People's Campaign. In 1973, she founded the Children's Defense Fund. She still is um, associated with that, even, even to this day. But back in 1966, that's when I was in college, my mother, my mother put on a social event in our home to honor Marion Wright Edelman, uh, who, had, who had passed the law board bar, and to tell her how proud they were of her. Now, that was probably more important to my mother than it was to Marion Wright Edelman, who was way up there and a national figure. But you know, I was proud of that because my mother was using her skill set to do want something and to take at least one step to cross a barrier and connect across that barrier of what we call racism. 
And that's what I want us to think about today. Taking a step within our skill set to address that issue. That, that takes me to common threads. Now, you may think somewhere down the line here that this is a um, recruitment pitch for common threads. It may be. But what I really want you to consider is something, it might be an option for you. It might be an option for you, one thing that you might participate in to respond to God's call to action in regard to one of the challenges which we face in our nation today. So that's the spirit in which I'm offering it to you, to think about it and to pray about it. You always have to consider what is God calling you to do? And I asked Renee to, to play that song, I'd, Sweet, Sweet Spirit, in this place. Uh, that's, that song is actually included in the Episcopal African American Hymnal. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful song. And the reason I wanted it, I, I tell you what, uh, we don't, we don't, I forgot we didn't have those hymnals in this church. Um, but it's a wonderful song because the message is, the Spirit is here. The Spirit is here. And that's always so important when people gather in the name of Jesus Christ to know that we're just not doing this because it's a good thing to do, but to feel that there is a sweet, sweet Spirit here to empower us to do what God wants us to do. So hold that in mind as well. So there's a handout, which I hope you have, and you can take with you as information. And Common Threads is a joint ministry of First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. And we've been meeting for about three years. But most importantly, for the past year, the planning team has put together three workshops last year. And there's going to be another workshop this fall. And the title of it is Anti-Racism Workshop. And to remind you just sort of what it, what it's about is in our mission statement, the very first one is let God guide us. So, so it's so important in this issue that we aren't guided by guilt or anything else. But what's God calling us to do? And to become friends in Jesus Christ and embrace his ministry of reconciliation. There's, there's that theme of community and relationships, reconciled relationships. And to honor our different traditions and celebrate our common threads, that makes sense. Even in this group here, there's their differences and their common threads. Celebrate what's good and let what's, what's not matching up, let it be. Promote racial equality. God loves everyone equally. Get over it. God doesn't have favorites. Equity, some people haven't had the opportunities that others have, and that issue needs to be addressed. Justice, what's fair? What's fair? And finally, believe in the hope of a beloved community. Beloved community is a great term, and it's really talking about God's reign on earth now, living according to the principles of Jesus Christ. But what the planning team has done most recently is decided, you know what, we've had three workshops and, and they've been good. As many as 40 people have participated. But what we feel called by God to do, what this planning team, five from St. James, five people from St. James, five people from First Baptist, felt called to do is to go deeper. Because this is still a huge issue in our local and national communities. So this is what we are planning on. The, these are the guidelines for this next workshop. And again, this is information for you to consider. Number one, get honest about my own racism and what I can do about it. That's sort of a, as a beginning point. I can tell you, I'm, 
I'm shocked. I've said this to you before. I'm shocked at the prejudice statements that sort of pop up in my mind sometimes. I confess it. I ask for forgiveness. But, and that's what we're called to do as people of faith is know the truth and deal with it as people who believe that God can bring healing, health, and hope into our lives. Number two, become comfortable and confident with difficult conversations and learn how to guide them towards instruments of healing, health, and hope. That's a critical one. And that's one we spent a good bit of time on. Conversations are critical. Not conversations to convince. That's an argument. Conversations to listen, to respect, and to love one another. And see what God does with that. Number three, become an anti-racism activist. You know, some people say, one thing that people are really afraid of is, please don't call me a racist. And so one thing we le we've learned that um, racist is not an identification, it is a behavior, racist behavior. And just like in our faith, we are, we are called to love the sinner and hate the sin, same thing. We're called to love everyone. But not, but not approve of racist behavior. And finally, find support for this challenging ministry through my faith in God and my trust in relationships. And that takes us right back to the theme throughout these two Sundays. Community, spirituality, and transformation, it's, it's a journey, it really is. Taking one step at a time, together, being led by God. I end these sermons with this blessing. Uh, and I, I used it last week. It's the Franciscan blessing, St. Francis of Assisi did not write it but it's in the spirit of St. Francis. It's written by Franciscans, and, and this is how it goes. May God bless you with restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. May God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless you with the gift of tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the, lo or the loss of all that they cherish so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and transform their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world so that you are able, with God's grace, to do what others claim cannot be done. Amen.